If you're gonna go fast, go it alone. If you wanna go far, you gotta go together. In this season where many are feeling like they're living a desert island experience. I want to bring us back together through stories. Although physically distant, our stories will bring us closer together and closer to God. Joining me this week on Desert Island Reflections is none other than Fiona Jocher. Fiona tells me that she loves learning new things and she also loves and enjoys organisational challenges. She says she's a strange mix of extrovert and introvert. I think I can relate to that. Um, she says she loves being with people but also she needs a lot of time just by herself being me. Fiona, welcome to Desert Island Reflections. Thank you. Maybe you would just um, share with us just what are you currently doing? Maybe even just where did you grow up and any sort of significant family moments that you'd like to share with us? Well, I grew up in Delvin, which is a small village about 10 miles from Mullingar. And uh, my mum and dad were both from big families which were around the area. So we had a very family upbringing. I was down in my grandmother's most Tuesdays. My mother helped my grandmother. She had uh, two sons, one married very late in life and one ma never married at all. So mom went down to help her mom with some of the farm work. So we were down there every Tuesday. My grandfather was a, polit was a county council. Wow. No. He'd had a really, really interesting life and he was, as I was growing up, he was housebound. 
Okay. And so he used to play cards with me while mom okay. did. I can't remember how to play cards and I can't remember what we talked about, but he talked a lot about politics okay. and I love politics. Wow. You were saying that you've been a stay at home mum for the last number of years. Yeah. How long has that been? So that's 26 years. Wow. <laughs> so we've, had, we've had six kids. God was very good to us. We had three boys and three girls. Okay, give us their names. Just so we I... had Alexandra uh -huh. um, and Christian, Tatiana, Natasha, Joshua and Isaac. When did God become real to you? Was that from an early age or was it a progressive thing as you... It was always real. Yeah. I, I don't remember a time. And it's extremely strange to me yeah. because my parents aren't religious okay. and my grandparents were quietly so in the old-fashioned okay. sense yeah. I didn't have a Bible and I didn't have any of wow. you know they shall I say Christian culture yeah, growing up yeah. we went to mass yeah. we had communion and confirmation but I just knew that I, I really really loved him and a priest came in when I was in second class and he was telling the story from Luke 17 of the lepers, uh -huh. the 10 lepers, and only one went back to say uh -huh. thank you. And I think that's the first gospel story I remember. And I remember just being bewildered. Yeah. <laughs> and I do, I remember them being there and thinking, that was just so bold of yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, I, I'd find, I couldn't figure out why they didn't yeah. want to go back and be yeah. with Jesus. Yeah. But nobody had told me about him, so I don't know how. Yeah. I think somebody was praying. Yeah. But who, I don't know. Was there a time in your life where it became extremely personal for you? Well, there was a, it was very gradual. Um, I was lucky I was in Loretto yeah. at the time they, in Mullingar, and they were, all of the nuns except one at that time were born again. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had books like The Cross and the Switchblade yeah, yeah, and yeah, books yeah. about yeah. George Miller. And I remember reading the salvation yeah. prayers then, and it was kind of, it was kind of growing. And then when I went to college, I was involved in chaplaincy in oh, college, okay. and the chaplain in college actually was uh, the officiant at our wedding. Lovely. Yeah, wow. and he prophesied at our wedding okay. over Ollie, wow. uh, because at that time Ollie had no faith, uh -huh. and um, he, so I and I'd always worked within the church, yeah. as it were, yeah. not in a, always in a very strange way, always at quite a deep level, uh -huh. and uh, actually got a cath full Catholic wedding when I shouldn't have had one, wow. because Ali wasn't of the Catholic faith, yeah. but the bishop at the time uh, gave me yeah. permission, because yeah. he knew me, yeah, yeah. Uh, to have a full Catholic wedding, and uh, so we had that, and then a uh, friend's from college invited me to an Alpha course. Okay, wow. And that's when all the pieces of the jigsaw that had been quite yes. loose yeah. all come into place. And the Holy Spirit Day was really, I, I really felt like now I've got what I've been looking yeah, for, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Was there like a person maybe within school or whatever that maybe was a good influence on you with your faith? Well, I think, I think so many of the Loretto nuns were. Yeah. I think Sister Bernadette was our principal. She was terrific. Sister Ida Kylie was huge to me as a friend. But Sister Philomena was there in the background all the time. And I was in her office one day and she had um, a little carving. And it was Isaiah 49. I will never forget you. I have carved you in the palm of my hand, yeah. even though a um, mother might forget her baby. And I'm adopted. So as a teenager, I had great parents. They're yeah. terrific and a great family, but there's still something just not connecting. Yeah. And as a teenager, things don't connect anyway. Yeah. And I remember looking at that and really feeling like that sums up all I feel about God that I just... I belong in him yeah, and I belong yeah, to him. Yeah. And I didn't know all the theology yeah, and yeah. all of that at that stage. Yeah. But at that scripture, I remember going, that just sums up all I've yeah. known up to now about God. Yeah. I just think how blessed I am yeah. that I know who I am. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm not worried about who I might be in the natural sense. I know who I am in the eternal sense. Yeah, yeah. Give us another signpost, like would there be 
kind of thing because because I know that you guys are, are part of um, is it IC ICJ ICJ how did you get involved with that and what was the lead into that and um, Naomi Hill she said to us over to you she said to me over to you when that year is cracked about Israel as my parents <laughs> and so she told her parents about us and Pamela invited me to something and I went to something and then they started having conferences and Ollie and I are doers. Yeah. So we see no reason why we should sit there. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So we just said, can we help? Yeah. And uh, Paul was stuck with something one day and Ollie helped him and I just went out and helped Pamela with other things. And that's how we just yeah. got involved. But it's huge sense for us as a family because of our German. We are really quite a German family. Yeah. I know people don't necessarily see that, but we've lived quite a German yeah. life. We keep quite a German calendar. Our Christmases yeah. are German. It's an amazing adventure. We've yeah. got to admit, meet amazing people. Um, when we were in Kilkenny, I was part of a prayer group. There was a siege in the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. Uh -huh. And we were praying because a Canon Andrew White, he was the he was Terry Waite's successor okay. as the Archbishop of Canterbury's uh -huh. envoy in the Middle East. He was leading the talks yeah. for that. So we were praying for that um, siege. And then strangely enough, in 26, 2015, we had him as the speaker yeah. for our national conference. Wow. So I got to meet him. Yeah. So how? I mean, what were the chances yeah, of that? Yeah, yeah. Tell us then going forward, like, is there anything you're excited about as we hopefully in the near future emerge from lockdown? I'm excited about whatever God's going to open for me next because he said he has a hope in a future and I don't know what it is, yeah. but he has joined the dots pretty well so far. Yeah. Well, listen, Fiona, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. We, we've weathered the storm <laughs> here. We've just, we've just made it through. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I suppose our goal with these, as we always say, is, you know, during this time of, of COVID and where we're sort of physically distant uh, through our stories, we can, you know, get closer together and closer to God. So thanks for taking the time to speak to us today. No problem. Thank you for...
Oh
Good morning, MCF family. This is just a little plug for a new season of Connect Groups uh, starting on the 24th of May. Listen, we have a few weeks um, to maybe hear from you if you have some suggestions for new Connect Groups. Uh, obviously, there'll be ones that are continuing um, as per the last number of months, the Bible study, Rock Solid, the clan, that's the young adults group and others, but we want to see if there's any interest out there for uh, new connect groups. So uh, whether that's a five-a-side football or whether it's a walking group or even I might do another group called Draw the Circle, which is a, 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 a small group meeting around prayer, but I'll give you more information on that next week. So listen, if you have any suggestions for a new Connect group, if you would send them uh, to Fiona or myself, and we'll see what the interest is. But like I said, we're going to start this new season of Connect groups starting on the 24th of May, which will continue for six weeks and take us up to the end of June. We're looking forward to welcoming you back to our in-person service. We'll also be streaming online, so you can decide for yourself what is best for you and your family. We have two locations for gathering in person. Location A is here in the ground floor of MCF. Location B is in the hub next door. Upstairs MCF will be keeping for when the kids church return in the future. Each Wednesday in the weekly email, you'll be invited to book through Eventbrite. Just simply click the link and submit your details. If you're not already subscribed to MCF Mailer, go to www.mullingarcf.ie slash email and put in your email address details. If you have any problem in doing so, please contact Fiona, our administrator, for help. When the 35 tickets have gone for the ground floor of MCF, we'll open up the hub as an overflow where the service can be streamed. We encourage early booking to secure your place. When you arrive, you'll be greeted by Allison or a member of her team. So are you the new guy? Yeah. Great. What's with the slippers? Oh, you know, I love my home comforts. I'm sure you have too. You're lucky actually I didn't come my PJs. Oh yeah. Use a sanitizer provided. If you've forgotten a mask, don't worry, we'll provide one. Allison and her team will direct you to the pre-assigned seat based on the size of your party. You'll need to wear your mask at all times and stay within your party and at two meters from other parties. Stay social at a distance. Once you've found your seat, we do ask that you remain seated for the service. Oh, uh, please, if you wouldn't mind, would you just pop your mask up there? Oh, oh, good man. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. You know, because of government restrictions, we can't really be uh, singing out loud. So we'd ask you to remain seated and you can make a joyful noise unto the Lord. But let's do it reflectively um, and quietly, maybe in a way that you'd maybe converse with your neighbour. Um, is that OK? Thanks. Our service will be shorter than normal, but we want to create the same connection that we had in small groups over Zoom. Therefore, at the end of the service, we'll spend some time catching up in small groups, reflecting on the message and praying for one another. After that, we'll depart. There will also be a breakout room on Zoom for those online. Just use the YouTube link to access this, just like before. Feel free to connect with each other in the car park afterwards at a safe distance. If you have any symptoms of COVID-19, please remain at home. We're really excited about getting back together again, and we just ask for your patience with the technology and logistics as we try to make all of this possible. For more details on MCF's COVID-19 protocol and policy, please see our website. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday, the 16th of May at 11 a.m.
Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to Satan and kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold and after it was sold? Wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped his body and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the man who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. The apostles healed many. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people and all the believers used to meet together in Sol Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared to join them even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought their sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. The apostles persecuted. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent, to the, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not, did not find them. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you just put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went in with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin uh, to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and determined to make us look guilty of this man's blood. Peter and all the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, Gamaliel the, the teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood in the Sanhedrin and ordered that, that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, carefully consider what you intend to do with to these men. Some time ago, Theudas appeared claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, all of his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. 
he too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin, rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that is Jesus is the Messiah. Two thousand years ago, people were drawn to a glow. A flame carried in the hearts of ordinary men and women, fueled by the Holy Spirit. They carried and demonstrated the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. Join us as we trek with them in acts, letting their actions speak to us as we listen up and live out the same calling to make disciples of all nations starting local and moving out. Well, good morning and welcome to the NCS service this morning. This may well be, believe it or not, the last time we do church in this way, which I'm a little bit sad about because I've begun to get a little bit used to this and the Zoom time has been quite fun and stuff, um, but I'm really excited about being back in person with you all. Um, speaking to an empty room is always um, weird, so uh, yeah, that, well, I certainly won't miss that and I'm sure Simon and all the other people speaking on Sunday um, will agree with me there. Um, it'll be so great to be back and having a cup of tea or coffee or whatever. Um, it might be a bit strange at first, but nonetheless, it'll be exciting. Um, it kind of feels like a, new, a kind of a new beginning in a way. We've probably used that word in way too many times in the past year. New beginnings, um, we've been disappointed. Um, but the, the, we're looking at the book of Acts in this series. And we're kind of looking at the relationship the early church had um, with the Holy Spirit. Um, and this is so, so important. And this is a little bit about what I'm going to be talking about this morning as well. Um, so, yeah, there's sort of a new beginning in the book of Acts, as we've already looked at. Acts chapter 1, um, they realize Jesus is gone, he's ascended, Where, what's happening? Tarry in the city, tarry in Jerusalem, wait till your, your power comes upon you through the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, they do, they go out, and thousands are saved, it's amazing, and we're all just like, and we're left reading this like, uh, where is this power today? Um, and this is kind of what we've been looking at the past few weeks at. Um, and I love this book. I love the book of Acts because, yeah, it's this new beginning. It's the beginning of the early church, um, the beginning of the church. Um, and, like, God is just moving in powerful ways. And I really hope that over the course of this series and um, beyond that we can really begin to move in power um, ourselves in this town. Um, as time, Simon says, we're a church not just in the town but for the town. We are here for um, the people. We are here to serve and we're actually here to be, as Jesus said, to be clothed with power um, from the Holy Spirit. Um, and that looks like signs, wonders and miracles. Um, and it looks especially like love um, to our neighbour and to the people around us. So I get the privilege of speaking from Acts chapter 5, probably not the chapter I would have chosen. Um, one of the most difficult um, uh, situations, I guess, that happens at the beginning of Acts chapter 5 in um, maybe church history, I don't know. Um, but what I want to say is this, everything the early church did um, was in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. They did everything they did with the Holy Spirit. There was nothing that they did in the first four chapters without him. Um, in the first chapter, we see they, they, they cast lots um, for uh, the, who's going to take Judas's place. And even that, in a sense, is kind of with the Holy Spirit. It was just a, a kind of an ancient way of um, almost gi giving, um, uh, I guess, God the, the say in, in, in something. It's kind of like drawing the short straw. Um, but they didn't even rely on themselves to make that decision themselves. Um, and when the Holy Spirit came upon them, obviously we know, um, they depended on the Holy Spirit all throughout it. Um, just think with me for a minute. The disciples, you're talking about these random group of guys who 
before they met Jesus, had these lives to themselves um, as maybe fishermen or, or tax collectors or whatever. Um, maybe some of them failed um, rabbi college um, and sort of, yeah, I don't know, got caught around the back smoking or something. Um, and they, yeah, they flunked out. Um, and just and they became maybe ordinary fishermen, tax collectors, like I said. Um, and they meet this guy, Jesus, and he totally rocks the boat, like totally messes them up. They're like, what? Like the, my, my, my like idea of what reality is, is completely changed because people are wa- like the dead are walking and like the lepers are being cleansed and the blind are seeing and people are feeling love and belonging and cared for. And these disciples are feeling this as well. And then something blows their mind. Jesus sends them out to go and preach the gospel and to do the same things. And they go out and they start using the name of Jesus and it starts to work. And they're like, what? Like, what is going on? Um, and so they, they have this dependence because before they had nothing. And then they meet Jesus, meet Jesus and he had everything. And then he gives them what they have. And now they seem to have everything as well. And then Jesus dies. And it like they just hit rock bottom. Um, and then he comes back, he's resurrected and as he, he, he's, he's ascending, they're like, what is going to happen now? But then the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they once again begin to work alongside the Holy Spirit, um, dependent upon him. How amazing is that, that we can depend on the Holy Spirit so fully in that way, and the disciples learned to do that. Okay, Jesus emphasized his dependence on both the Father and his Spirit. So the disciples got to learn from the best. When he ascended, the Holy Spirit descended. Before this moment, the disciples were so aware that they could do nothing without him, so much so that they they even cast lots to see who would take Judas' place. Everything was done with the Holy Spirit until Acts chapter 5. As Stephen read, we know this challenging um, chapter, challenging um, verse. I'm going to specifically be looking at this this segment kind of from Acts chapter 5. Um, in this chapter, we see Ananias and Sapphira struck dead for lying to the Holy Spirit. Consider yourselves warned. Incredible. I, I, like, I don't want to analyze the theological implications too much of this passage. It's It's challenging, Uh, it's interesting. My encouragement to you would be go away, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you, read it, read it again, um, ask for wisdom, um, and take everything I say with a pinch of salt as well, and let the Holy Spirit guide you um, into learning um, truth. Let him guide you into all truth, as Jesus said. Um, I wanna say this, we carry so much more than we realize, okay? I don't believe there's any proof to suggest that Ananias and Sapphira just sinned really badly. Like, well, the reason I say this is because in Mark, 3, Mark chapter 3, verse 28, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes, blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. So I don't want to say that Jesus says, I will forgive them all their sin and every slander they utter. So it's not like they just kind of wrong moment, wrong place, wrong moment, wrong time. They just did something really badly. There's something more than that because Jesus wants to forgive everything. I, I want to suggest that they didn't just drop dead by chance. It happened because they weren't aware of what they carried within them. See, in Leviticus 10, we see a very similar thing happen, okay? Um, Leviticus chapter 10 um, is a really important, or Leviticus as as a book is really important. It's a guidebook for God's newly redeemed people, which shows them how to worship, serve, and obey a holy God, okay? Let me read you this, or you can turn over to Leviticus chapter 10 if you want. Verse 1. Um, No, actually, end, end of Leviticus chapter 9. I'm sorry, I have it written on a page here, so I'm not sure of the verse, but it's the end of um, Leviticus chapter 9. Then Aaron lifted his hands toward the people and blessed them, and having sacrificed the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the fellowship offering, he stepped down. Moses and Aaron then went into the tent of meeting. When they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. 
Aaron's sons, this is now Leviticus 10, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them and added incense, and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Consider yourselves warned, is probably what all the Israelites were thinking when this happens, and probably all the priests as well. Like, I don't want to go in there. Um, as the new Christians in Acts chapter 5, I'm wondering, they were probably just watching this thinking, or at least those who knew the scriptures, which probably most of them did, um, at least in some capacity, they were probably watching this, and they probably had this weird sense of deja vu. Like, I've seen this somewhere before, because it's eerily similar to this chapter, or this passage in Leviticus chapter 10. Ananias and Sapphira, Nadab and Abihu. Really interesting. We can be sure that Ananias and Sapphira were Christians, okay? It doesn't say they were imposters. We can, we can sort of be sure that they were Christians. They were the temples of God, okay? Like God's temple, carrying his Holy Spirit within them. In this, we see that God has a way of holiness for us as priests, okay? So think about this. God has put his Holy Spirit so fully into you, so much so that in, in the words of Galatians 2.20, it says, um, for I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. It is Christ who lives in me. The Holy Spirit is more real than you could ever imagine in you right now. If you're a Christian and you've received Christ, the Holy Spirit has overtaken you. And so kind of what this is saying, I, I believe as my own, um, interpretation is that God wants us to be so much clothed with the Holy Spirit. He is in us, around us, through us. He is more us than we are us in a weird kind of way, okay? And when, when there, there's, I won't use this word, disintegration, okay? When um, uh, Ananias and Sapphira did what they did, they sort of, I guess, disintegrated who they were. They weren't just people anymore. You, we have to understand that. They weren't just ordinary Joes. They were Christians now, filled with the Holy Spirit, put the Holy of Holies into them. Nadab and Abihu came before the Holy of Holies, the tabernacle of God, the power of God. Like something approaching the sun, like the, the, the sun, it just burns up. And, and Ananias and Sapphira were doing the same thing and God had set them apart to be able to commune with him, to be united with him. But they came and they approached that and they didn't realize what they carried. So I don't want to start into a, a thing of don't do this or don't do that or be afraid. No, that's not what I'm saying. I believe that God has given us freedom. I don't believe that you're going to, the way I heard it taught, um, uh, these passages about blaspheme against the Holy Spirit was really that you'll know if you're in that place. Like you'll be so far from God. And I'm sure that Ananias and Sapphira were. I don't think there's any fear of you just dropping dead. So if you're listening to this, be encouraged because God wants to put his love upon you. And, and we're, we're called not to disintegrate ourselves by lying to who we are ourselves, I believe. So be encouraged. It's, it's, I, I don't believe it's going to happen to you unless you're literally shaking your fist at God. Um, don't do that. I've got four keys, I, I believe, to living as a temple, okay? Four keys to living as a temple. If you're taking notes, um, you can write them down. Uh, each key um, is going to be followed by a question for you to sort of reflect on yourself, to think about, am I living this out in my life? This is not an exhaustive list of how to live as, as a temple of God. Um, this is just... Um, Kind of a guide in some of the stuff that I believe the Lord has been speaking to me recently um, about living as a temple of God. Um, we are like a mini temple kind of walking around. Uh, I've entitled this sermon Temples, Temples in the Temple because in Acts chapter 5 we see the disciples are ministering in the temple as temples. To, they're ministering to people. Um, but they are, they are the temples, interestingly. Um, so, yeah, I've got the questions um, that you can, for you to consider as well after each point in your own personal walk with God. The first one is this. You are already pure. You are already pure. And the question is this. What sin, perfectionism, or failure do I need to think of as dead? What sin, perfectionism, or failure do I need to think of as dead? 
The temple was a place of purity, a consecrated place. Everything had to be perfectly set apart for ministry to God. You have been given this ministry. You are a temple and you are pure. You have been purified just like Solomon. The temple was consecrated before the Lord. It was holy. It was perfect. You also have been perfected because of Christ's death and resurrection. Daily you can wake up and you can be confident in the fact that God has purified you. He has set you apart. He has cleaned you. You are already clean and pure. This is a simple Christian one, Christianity 101. You are already pure. Okay, Romans 6.11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The uh, other translations say, in the same way, reckon yourselves or consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God. It talks about the helmet of salvation. One author says, think, the helmet goes over the head, think saved. Think of yourself as saved, okay? Don't think of yourself as dead, as like in, in the good sense, but don't think of yourself as dead in sin. If you are a Christian, you have been saved from your sin and there is freedom for you today. Being sin conscious will make you avoid God. Being sin conscious will make you avoid God. Dying to sin means letting grace remove it. Stop searching your own heart. Let God do the searching. Don't be in your head searching, have I done something wrong? Am I, am I doing something wrong? Let God do that. Um, Psalmist David says, search my heart, O God, and see if there is any wicked way within me. It doesn't say, search my heart, David. Search my heart, me. No, search my heart, O God. Let me read you a little story. The great Chinese Christian leader, Watchman Nee, tells of a young man who came to see him in deep distress. He said, no matter how much I pray, no matter how hard I try, I simply cannot seem to be faithful to my Lord. I think I'm losing my salvation. Nee responded, do you see this dog here? He is my dog. He is house trained. He never makes a mess. He is obedient. He is a pure delight to me. Out in the kitchen, I have a son, a baby son. He makes a mess. He throws his food around. He fouls his clothes and he is a total mess. But who is going to inherit my kingdom? Not my dog. My son is my heir. There's no doubt about it, guys. God hates sin. But the good news is, is he loves you so much more. I want you to be more aware of God's love for you than you are aware of your own sin. That's point number one. You're already pure. The second thing is keep putting things on the altar. Okay? The question is, what, am I, what, what are you putting on the altar? Ask yourself that. What am I putting on the altar? Keep something burning. In the Old Testament temple, we see offerings being given up night and day to God. The priests were to burn animals. This was considered worship. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So what are you burning? Romans 12 is a brilliant passage which talks about the unity that's needed amongst believers. I'd really encourage you, if you have some time, just to read through Romans 12. Because it's like an offering, this unity, this love. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Read it in your own time and think about what am I offering to God, okay? Are you offering love? Are you offering your gifts, your time, your music, your service? These are all gifts of worship. Be obedient to God in what he asks you to put on the altar. Okay? Uh, This is not just a a thing of saying, oh, you know, serve in church. No. Whatever God has called you to do, go and do it, whether that's in church, whether that's in 
um, your, just, just your life, just offer yourself. And let me say, well, the best way that you can serve, the best way that you can be worship is by loving one another, by serving people, individuals, unity amongst believers. Lower yourself, be humble. That is the sacrifice that God loves so much. He loves that. Don't think of yourself too highly. It's a simple thing and it's a sacrifice. Okay, so what are you putting on the altar? The third point, you carry the holy of holies. Okay, and the question is this, am I living in union with God? Am I living in union with God? We see in the temple of God this incredibly good but scary picture of the holiest of holies where God's presence was. It was the inner chamber, okay? Um, the inner chamber. When Jesus died, he said, he, he, he said it is finished, and he gave up his spirit, all that. Um, and it, there's this um, picture of, of how it describes when the, 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 the curtain of the temple was torn in two. It's like just so symbolic of God opening up the way for us to enter into his presence, okay? It was in the Holy of Holies that Nadab and Abihu were struck dead. And in a sense, it was where Ananias and Sapphira were also struck dead because they carried that in their hearts. Are you aware of what you're carrying? The tabernacle of God is with men, says Revelation 21. God has put his spirit into you. He wants to live in union. Back to Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I love what Dallas Willard, I've been recently reading a book by him called Hearing God. And one particular part of it, he talks about moving from communion to union with God. Moving from communion to union in the church moving from community to unity. God's goal for us is not just communion with him, but union. He wants to put himself into me. He wants to make me like Christ. He wants to be so woven into every part of us that when people encounter us, they will encounter God. That may sound to some like almost crazy. Like how could I be like God? And while I'm not saying that you are like God or that you are God, what I am saying is that God wants to put his, God has already, if you're a Christian, put his spirit into you. And he wants to bring that out so that when people encounter you, they'll be encountering God. This is the wonder of the gospel. This is the amazing thing about God. Is he's so secure in himself that he's willing to put his own spirit into us. He shows this, this beautiful picture of this in the marriage covenant where two become one. Again, that's mind-blowing. Everything he does in our lives is trying to unite us with himself. He's stretching our faith. He's doing all these things to bring us into unity with himself. Yield to, to him. Yield to this union. Allow him to weave himself into you so that people will encounter the extreme goodness of God, the holiest of holies in you. Am I living in union with God? And the last one is this. You are a meeting place. And the question is this. Who am I conspiring with for the kingdom? Who am I conspiring with for the kingdom? We see in the book of Acts that the temple was a meeting place as well as a place of worship. This is a beautiful picture of the coming together of the church. The physical temple now became this place where people not only worship, but they met together. We are called to live in divine unity with one another. Philippians 2 is one of my favorite passages about this. It says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, highlight that. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in his spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition 
or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Who are you conspiring with for the kingdom? Get with your people. Get with the people, the two, three, four people that God has called you to. Pray with them. Worship with them. Do life with them. Make covenant. You've been called together to serve. Serve one another. Live in humility. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And if you know scriptures, you know the rest. Read Philippians 2 in your own time. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. These verses speak for themselves. The church of God is at its best when we are loving one another and giving our lives away to one another. If we are going to be a church in the town and for the town, they will know us by our love for one another. They will know us by our love for one another. These are my four things on being a temple of God. Like I said, it's not exhaustive. I really believe that God wants us to realize what we carry, the wonder, the depth of who we are now in Christ is so much more than we can possibly imagine. And we carry, God wants to, like the early church, there's more, there is, it's true that there is more power in the kingdom available for us to walk in the kind of, um, power that they walked in the signs and wonders and miracles those are not just for the early church they're for today and unity in the church um, is vital in this that we don't become like over or, or like over um, fascinated by the, the extras the signs and wonders and miracles but we become fascinated with the unity with God and the unity with the believers this is who the, the early church was I even make the suggestion like I, I said at the beginning the Holy Spirit they did everything with the Holy Spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit didn't have to come upon them for them to be united. In fact, when he saw they were united, he came upon them. The temple was built when the, 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 the bricks very precisely laid. And God very precisely lays his bricks as well. Let me close with a prophecy from Isaiah 2. I love this. Think about us in a church in the town for the town. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. Now, in prophetic language, mountains often refers to a pic like authorities. It's a picture of like authorities. So the authority of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the authorities. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will set, settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for, for war anymore. We are a church in the town for the town. And I want to pray that you would receive the blessing of God's Holy Spirit come upon you. Why don't you just hold out your hands in front of you? Come Holy Spirit. Would you just reveal to every person watching the wonder of what they carry and fill them afresh this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
We're looking forward to welcoming you back to our in-person service. We'll also be streaming online, so you can decide for yourself what is best for you and your family. We have two locations for gathering in person. Location A is here in the ground floor of MCF. Location B is in the hub next door. Upstairs MCF will be keeping for when the kids' church return in the future. Each Wednesday, in the weekly email, you'll be invited to book through Eventbrite. Just simply click the link and submit your details. If you're not already subscribed to MCF Mailer, go to www.mullingarcf.ie slash email and put in your email address details. If you have any problem in doing so, please contact Fiona, our administrator, for help. When the 35 tickets have gone for the ground floor of MCF, we'll open up the hub as an overflow where the service can be streamed. We encourage early booking to secure your place. When you arrive, you'll be greeted by Allison or a member of her team. So are you the new guy? Yeah. Great. What's with the slippers? Oh, you know, I love my home comforts. I'm sure you have too. You're lucky actually I didn't come my PJs. Oh yeah. Use a sanitizer provided. If you've forgotten a mask, don't worry, we'll provide one. Allison and her team will direct you to the pre-assigned seat based on the size of your party. You'll need to wear your mask at all times and stay within your party and at two meters from other parties. Stay social at a distance. Once you've found your seat, we do ask that you remain seated for the service. Oh, uh, please, if you wouldn't mind, would you just pop your mask up there? Oh, oh, good man. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. You know, because of government restrictions, we can't really be uh, singing out loud. So we'd ask you to remain seated and you can make a joyful noise unto the Lord. But let's do it reflectively um, and quietly, maybe in a way that you'd maybe converse with your neighbour. Is that okay? Thanks. Our service will be shorter than normal, but we want to create the same connection that we had in small groups over Zoom. Therefore, at the end of the service, we'll spend some time catching up in small groups, reflecting on the message and praying for one another. After that, we'll depart. There will also be a breakout room on Zoom for those online. Just use the YouTube link to access this, just like before. Feel free to connect with each other in the car park afterwards at a safe distance. If you have any symptoms of COVID-19, please remain at home. We're really excited about getting back together again, and we just ask for your patience with the technology and logistics as we try to make all of this possible. For more details on MCF's COVID-19 protocol and policy, please see our website. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday, the 16th of May at 11 a.m.